There's been a lot of focus in the last 12 or 15 hours or so on whether this package adds to inflation. So let me make a few things really clear. One, of the total spending we announced for next year, more than a quarter of the net impact relates to keeping existing government programs going and extending pandemic support. Two, in total, the targeted relief that we're delivering in 2023-24 costs around 0.1% of GDP. And three, it's been designed to provide effective, meaningful relief to households throughout the year, not in one big hit. For all these reasons, the Treasury advice to us was that none of what we're doing here will have a counterproductive impact. What's more, our targeted inter interventions in, these area, in those areas where price pressures are most acute will directly take the pressure off inflation by some three quarters of a percentage point next year. And that means inflation will be lower in 2023-24 than what we forecast in October. Still higher than we'd like and still more persistent than is ideal, but down from what we would have been and making a meaningful difference to families and others around the country as a consequence. So inflation was central to our thinking in how we went about providing relief to households in the execution of our fiscal strategy, but also in how we thought about growth. Our goal here has always been to engage on the supply side of the economy by investing in people, in productivity and participation and in the biggest single opportunity of this defining decade, the energy transformation in particular. And you saw last night that the additional $4 billion we dedicated to the energy transformation brought this government's investment in the industrial and economic opportunities of cleaner and cheaper energy to $40 billion making it a central focus of our growth strategy. And today I want to explain why. Uh, at the start of my remarks, I referred to the era of, e era of economic progress that our Labor predecessors saw us through, a series of big set pieces designed to unlock the shackles on our economy and make the most of this transformative era of openness taking hold around the world. Today, the task of our generation is to find the right policy levers to make the most of an entirely different transformation, this time in energy. And when I think where Australia fits into the global story, one fact really springs to mind. We have an abundance of the resources that will power the world's efforts to combat climate change and the potential to produce renewable energy at a lower cost than the rest of the world. This means that cheap, renewable power can act as a fundamental comparative advantage on which we can build new ones as well, especially when other countries in our region don't have access to the same plentiful renewable power that we do. That's why we're so focused on the industrial opportunities of net zero. And the journey that we're on here is not just about reducing the energy costs of existing businesses, as important as that is. It's also creating space for the creation of new ones and all of the dynamism that comes from that. But if we are to succeed here, we need to do more than just transform our grid. Our countries around the world are making moves and making strategic investments in the new industries of the net zero economy. And that obviously includes the United States through its Inflation Reduction Act, but it extends to Canada and Europe and more. Now, we could have seen this as a threat or just let the opportunities of this defining decade fall to others. But instead, we see it as our big challenge and our big chance to partner with friends and allies to take our central place in the new developing supply chains of the net zero economy, in hydrogen, in battery components, green metals and more. That's why you've seen in this budget uh, and the last a long term signal to key markets and clear practical actions to encourage productivity enhancing investment in the industries we can thrive in a safeguard mechanism that provides certainty for business, new targeted investments in our hydrogen future last night, a national reconstruction fund that will partner with private industry to move up and along new renewable value chains, and targeted incentives for households and small business to reduce their energy usage and save on their bills. Now, as a Labor government, we want the opportunities associated with these new and growing industries to be available to as many Australians in as many parts of the country as possible. And you saw that last night in our announcements of more than $1.4 billion to support regional decarbonisation, a new net zero authority and an historic skills agreement as well. 
And it's also a big part of why we're putting in place a new framework to di address disadvantage in communities like the one that I grew up in and represent now, focusing on people and place and local knowledge and the power of communities to gather people in, to lift them up and to expand and broaden opportunity in our society. And in many ways, what aligns, what unites our approach to disadvantage, our approach to growth, a lot of what's in last night's budget, is an effort to try and cooperate across state boundaries and with communities wherever and whenever we can. Working together so that what would otherwise pass as moments in time become staging points in progress. I'm confident that that's how this budget will be seen, just like the one prior and ideally the one to come as well.